Hi everyone, I'm Arthur Benjamin and this is Farrah White. Welcome to For the Love of Dogs. Each week we try to introduce you to amazing animal rescue organizations. These organizations work tirelessly saving the lives of all kinds of animals. Today we have a band that's excited about it. Today we have another great one. Yes, did you know, Arthur, that the Great Dane is among the largest dog breeds in the world? Male Danes can grow to nearly four feet tall, up to 200 pounds, and any organization that cares for Great Danes has to have a big heart and lots of money. Absolutely. So meet Kim Melanson and Kareen Janik with the Great Dane Rescue of North Texas, and they're here to tell us more about their organization and to introduce us to one of their rescues. Welcome, you guys. Hi. And Thanks welcome to Dash. Show. Yes, and look at Dash. <laughs> he is dashing, isn't he? He is, he is a very special fellow. And he's up for adoption. Yes, Dash is one of our uh, special needs uh, foster dogs. He um, came to us from a local shelter because he was unadoptable in the shelter system. He um, had a damaged leg, and we brought him in. And he's going to um, show it off. He's going to show off his damaged leg, and um, we've cared for him, and we've had him to all very different veterinarians. And we're looking for a home for him that's prepared to handle his special needs. Well, he gets around real well on the three legs, with the uh, one leg as a balancing arm. Yeah. And uh, you know, before we go there. What made you fall in love with Great Danes? Well, I think that um, I, I, the joke at my house is big girl, big dog. Um, but I've always loved <laughs> dogs, and I think that our first, re my first rescue was a dog adopted from the ASPCA as a puppy, and we didn't really know what he was. We thought he was a little lab, and we got him to the vet, and he was growing, growing. The vet said, "Wow, Great Dane in him is really starting to show." And after we picked my husband up off the floor, that's how we ended up with our first Dane. Um, <laughs> And I've just loved them ever you since. You and the Dane picked your husband up off of the floor? The, yeah. So at the thought of it being a great Dane, your husband <laughs> passed out. Yeah. He was, <laughs> it was a little bit bigger than he was prepared for, I think. But it, it really helped me fall in love with the breed. Um, they're very gentle. They're very sensitive. Um, and they're very great family companion dogs. Well, and they love, they can sit with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they can share your furniture. <laughs> you can share your couch with you. It's funny your about bed. Great Danes that they all do that. They all will go and sit. Yes, and it's important to for people to know too, though, because some people don't necessarily want the dogs to sit on the couch. So it's a training thing. Mm -hmm. um, generally, our fosters are not allowed to sit on furniture because when they get adopted out to forever homes, we don't know if their forever home is going to let them sit on the couch. So it's a personal decision that their forever home makes. My personal dog, she, ha you know, pretty much. She lets you know where she wants to sit. We've made an exception for Dash and furniture because of his uh, special needs, yes. and it really makes it easier for him to get up and down. Well, tell us a little bit more about Great Dane, the Great Dane Rescue of North Texas. Great Dane Rescue of North Texas has been around since 2001, which is a long time for some mm -hmm. of these rescues. We um, are an all-volunteer 501c group. Nobody makes any money. We are solely foster home based, which means all of our dogs are in foster homes who are volunteers. No shelter. We do not have a shelter. They don't do well in a kennel environment. The other issue really is when they're in a shelter, it can be very difficult to evaluate them. And we're talking about dogs 100, 150 pounds. And when you're talking about bringing that into your home, you, you want to know, are they going to eat my cat? Are they good with kids? What issues might they have? Do they counter surf? Do they counter surf? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what issues might they have to let them place? They're extremely sensitive breed. So by placing them in foster homes, we're able to do things like evaluate for temperament, mm -hmm. evaluate for any anxieties, so we're allowed to see, are they good with kids? Um, do they need a stay at home family? Or are they okay being left alone while you're at work all day? So by having foster homes, one, it keeps costs down. Mm -hmm. Two, it allows us to evaluate them, but also start their training right away. When a foster gets a dog, one of the, thing, the first things they work on is potty training. Sometimes they come potty trained, sometimes they don't. But they can pick up their training from where the dog is at. Um, and if sometimes that's basics like potty training, and sometimes that's leash training um, and you know, basic obedience. Now, when you say that they're a sensitive breed, hit on that just a little bit. What do you mean? People frequently say to us, 
oh my gosh, you have to have, I don't have a big enough yard, or oh, I don't have um, enough space for them. They want all they, this is what they want to do. They want to be with their people. That doesn't mean they don't need their walks. It doesn't mean they don't need activity. But they are very sensitive to the needs of their people. They want to be with hu people. They want to be with other dogs. Um, it's interesting. They do not do well in shelters. They, um, and you can tell with Dash, when Kareen has two very small children, and he will temper his play to the children. Um, they're very in tune with their people. My personal saying is, you know, very in tune. You know, if I'm sad, she's going to come lay in the bed with us. Um, so I think that, not that all dogs don't do that, mm -hmm. but these guys particularly are very in tune. They're, they're companion dogs. So how many Danes would you say you've rescued? As of um, this week, it was 1,468 dogs wow, have come through amazing. our program. Um, we are 100% privately funded. We receive no government funding. We receive no tax dollars. We rely solely on individual donations and organizations like American Dog Rescue and for the, for the love of dogs who take an interest in us and fund us. Um, we're relatively small. Um, we, um, every dog that comes through us first gets a full veterinary exam and they're clinically evaluated. Um, the obvious things like alters, spay and neuters, uh, f being treated for heartworm prevention and tick-borne diseases, which Dash also came to us with a tick-borne disease, and we'll talk about that when we talk about Dash. Um, and mange, Demodex mange, if you saw in the slideshow, you saw Hope's picture. Demodex is very treatable and preventable if it's caught. If it's not treated, it, it, they develop secondary skin infections. Mm. We do treat for those things. Um, we've had everything from hip replacements, broken bones, Skin heartworm. infections, heartworm. Ninety-seven percent of the dogs that come to us is, are heartworm positive. That is one hundred percent preventable. Yeah, it's a monthly prevention. It is as it, for the Danes. It's approximately eight to ten month dollars a month. Uh, for a smaller dog, it's less. Um, tick. It, it's one hundred percent preventable. Or ninety-seven percent. I guess nothing's probably one hundred percent preventable. So ninety-seven percent of the dogs that come to us do have heartworms, and we treat for that. Mm. It's expensive, and it can take six weeks to a year, a year. years yeah. to clear them. And mm -hmm. they stay with us during that time. Um, and it's very hard on the dogs, too. It's, sure. not a, it's not a painless procedure for the dog, yeah. by any means. And mm -hmm. sometimes they don't survive the treatment. Um, the, the treatment uh, involves, it's sort of like, I assimilate it to chemotherapy. Oh, you have wow. to make them sick to make them well. Uh, so the treatment is very hard on them also. Yeah. So a lot of people who watch don't know about the worm diseases typically hookworms, roundworms, puppies have them. You give them three doses of uh, a, a worm preventative, they give them up. But heartworms are worms that settle in the heart. They like spaghetti inside the heart. Eventually, it'll fill up the heart and stop the heart from working. It is, it is fatal. And so a simple blood test tells you whether they have them. You begin to, to uh, treat it if they have them. The treatment is long. There are a couple of different treatments, some harder than others, and depending on the dog, it's one or the other, or what you can afford and how long you want to take. The shorter one's more dangerous for the dog than the longer one, but they're treatable, and uh, we can save dogs with them. The other thing that people, I think, don't understand with the prevention is that heartworms are transmitted by the mosquito. It, when I moved to Texas, I had never seen mosquitoes the size of helicopters, but we, <laughs> we have a lot of them here. And I thought one they were hummingbirds. <laughs> oh my word. Uh, one bite from an infected mosquito can infect a dog and it can kill them and it's a very slow and painful death. It's very important that, there do that dogs are kept and cats. Cats can get heartworm. Indoor cats ca can get heartworm. Indoor dogs can get heartworm. It's important that they are kept on year-round heartworm prevention and it's important that even as indoor dogs, I always laugh when people say, well my dog's inside all the time. I go, does the dog never go outside and tinkle? Right. You know, or you've, have you never had a mosquito in your house? You know, it, 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 one bite from a right. mosquito can infect them. And it's them. simple because it's one pill, a month, one pill a month and if you never stop it, you never have to worry about it. But before you begin it, don't ever give a dog heartworm prevention medicine before you have it tested because that'll kill the dog. And the medication is by prescription through your veterinarian. There are some online um, things that you can get, but it's the, the true prevention and the true treatment is through a qualified veterinarian. 
And it is something that you should test your dog annually, even if you're on prevention, test your dog annually to make sure and take that pill every month. Um, there are other forms you can do injectables. Yeah. And he them. does one because he goes back and forth from here to Florida at times, and he does one that prevents f fleas as well. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and there are others that'll prevent yeah. ticks from attaching, but uh, you know, uh, you talk to your vet, get the best one for your dog in the air, in the Texas area. Generally, it's just for heart. And, and one of the other things that we're seeing an awful lot of this year, uh, in the last really two years, have been tick-borne diseases. Um, not just for the ticks that you see here in Texas, but we're seeing ticks come from the East Coast and from the North. Uh, so it is important to do not just heartworm prevention, to do not just heartworm prevention, but also flea and tick prevention. Fleas and ticks can also carry life-threatening diseases, not just for your pets, but for your family. Uh, and with a very inexpensive monthly treatment prescribed by your veterinarian, you can minimize the risk of all completely, of that. Completely, which people should do more of. I'm really glad that we talked about that, especially the heartworms, because you're right, it is such a simple fix. Yeah, and I think people are uneducated about it, and I mm -hmm. think people think that because we, we oh, during the winter, you don't have to do it during the winter when you don't have mosquitoes, but you do need to do it year-round. Yeah. Um, especially with our mild winters, you, you have fleas and ticks sure. all year-round. Now tell us, how, what happened with his leg? Basically, what we were able to determine um, with some research and stuff is that when he was a young puppy between six months or so, he, his leg was broken. Um, the family who had him um, did not seek immediate care, but down the road did seek care, and they paid to have a surgery done on him, but he was not rehabbed properly. Um, oftentimes, with a broken bone like this and the extensive surgery that he obviously had, he, uh, he needed crate rest, and this is kind of what happens when you you don't follow the doctor's orders, basically. Um, he, the plate inside is separated from the bone, so therefore it makes it where he can't bear weight on it. Um, the, the vets have assured us that he's not in any pain from it, but it's just become a, you know, an immobile you know, limb, basically. So um, he, it doesn't really slow him down. It does make it difficult for him to get down or up from a laying down on the floor position, so he often likes to sit on the furniture and spread out. Um, but I mean, he also at the time when he came to us, we were unaware, he was described as anorexic and I've never met really an anorexic dame before. He was 15 month old when he came to us. Oh wow. You don't have anorexic 15 month old dogs. <laughs> but he, it was true, he just, he didn't want to eat. You know, we ran blood tests and all, you know, did all kinds of lab work on him. We could tell there was some sort of infection there, but you know, it took us a while to determine once we did a full tick panel that um, that you know he had this really rare tick-borne illness, and so it took about three months of doxycycline, which is a strong antibiotic, mm -hmm. for him to basically you know test negative for that that disease. And once he tested negative, he then you know started to gain back his his appetite. And we've been you know because of his limb, uh, we want to put weight on him slowly, and he's also you know. He was at that gangly, tall phase of his life anyway, so it was a <laughs> double challenge. But, um, you know, he's starting to, you know, he's getting very muscular up front because that's where he likes to carry the majority of his weight. But he's filling out. I mean, before you could see every rib, you could see every Aww. vertebrae. He really looked like a, an emaciated Dane. And it, was, it wasn't that he didn't have access to food. He just didn't feel like eating. So let's describe what his forever home would look like. So uh, it, would you just give the audience a yeah. feeling. Part of what we do at Great Dane Rescue is that when people apply to adopt, we try to, we match them with dogs that are going to meet the temperament, not just of, not just what they want, but what's going to ma match their lifestyle and their family. A lot of times people come and they say they want a puppy, but they work 10 hours a day and they have right. toddlers and they, they, they're not realizing work. what they're saying. Yeah. <laughs> so part of what we do is try to educate them and generally most people go you know you're right I don't want a puppy yeah. I do want and I do see the benefits of an older dog or people look at a picture and they look at a one by one picture on the internet and they go, I have to have this dog and I'm like well you have cats and he eats cats yeah you know and it's not like he like he likes cats with ketchup it's not gonna work <laughs> um, or they live in an apartment and it's a known barker right. so we try to make sure that we match not just personalities and what the people want and like but also what their temperament and their lifestyle right. matches. Can be the best fit. For, yeah. for Dash, if Dash were healthy, he could go anywhere. Kareen has two small children who he adores. She has two small dogs who he adores. 
The issue with Dash is his health. So we want to make sure he goes to a home that is prepared for some potential long-term uh, health problems and can afford the veterinary care if necessary. We want to make sure we have a home that if it doesn't have carpet, they're comfortable putting down some throw rugs and area rugs so he has safe passage through the home. And we want to make sure that there's no bigger dogs because he does love to play. He, we don't want him playing with a big dog that he could get injured with. So it has to be a lifestyle that can handle, keep him safe and keep him healthy as well as handle the special needs. It probably should also be nice to have a family that's home a lot during the day since crating him for long periods of time, he does get stiff and it, it is harder would. for him. Mm -hmm. He does better when he can move around during the day um, and have access to the outside to, to use the potty. Well, and I know you have a few other dogs we do. that are for adoption, so tell us their names. Oh my gosh, we currently have about 20 dogs in the program. Um, if you look at danerescue.net mm -hmm. and our Dane's Available page, you'll see them all. We have Murphy, who uh, we have Murphy, who I think is a three or four year old male, who is just very sweet. Oh, there's Cooper on the screen right now. Cooper was originally estimated to be about four years old. After we got him in foster care, we really believe he is younger than that. Um, Cooper will do well with a family with another big dog. Um, probably not too small children because he is very active and he he's a little what we call size stupid. <laughs> and will knock children over and it is a little rough for smaller children. That is uh, Dexter. Um, Dexter is really a sweet boy. He is living with a family with a nine-year-old girl and some cats. Now Dexter's a good example of somebody who does like cats and not, not with ketchup. He likes, <laughs> he's respectful of cats. He's respectful. of He can live and with a kitty that? cat. who's that? Oh, that's Emilio. Emilio is a, is a younger dog. Emilio is about uh, a year, we're estimating between a year, a year and a half, Emilio is available for adoption also. He uh, is um, currently living with, a, he is living with some older Great Danes and a medium sized dog. We haven't fully evaluated him yet with smaller children or cats, but he is a very sweet lover dude. He does need some basic training. He's a bit of a puller on the leash. Um, he does need some leash training, but he is crate trained and house trained. Now, do you think having a professional photo helps? I absolutely think having a professional photo helps. And we're very, very fortunate at Dane Rescue that we've worked with some very good photographers. But captures by Aaron, there's Dash's picture by Aaron. Captures by Aaron in, in Fort Worth donates all of the professional sittings. She donates all of the photographs for our website. Does for, it help? Absolutely. I tell our fosters all the time, hey, pictures help, sell. Um, that is Isabel. Isabel came to us. Um, I don't know if they showed the pictures of her skin condition when she came to us. She was wearing a t-shirt and it was duct taped to her. Oh, and when no. we took it off, she had a really bad infection. But the, the professional pictures, there it is. The professional pictures oh. absolutely help. Um, I also think that the professional pictures, it's sort of like glamour shots. Sure. You know, I think it's good for them to have those pictures. Oh, it's in. good for all of us to have yeah. those pictures. So you can learn more about Great Dane Rescue of North Texas by visiting their website, danerescue.net. And you can also keep up with their Facebook page, and you can find out their all of their different activities on Twitter. And let's help Dash find a home. Absolutely. Contact Kim, Kim if you're interested, or if you think Dash is big, wait till you see George and Zeus. For more on these Great Danes when we come right back. Well, thanks you guys so much for, for being here today and sharing all of your fosters that you have and all of their beautiful photos. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. And you'll have to keep us updated and let us know as these dogs get adopted out. Thank so, you. yeah, don't go anywhere. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to the Love of Dogs. Meeting Dash reminds us just how big those Great Danes can be great. But did you know that Danes are even bigger than Dash? Well, we recently came across a story about George the Great Dane. And George was featured on ABC's Good Morning America. And here's what happened when Cameron Matheson met up with this gentle giant. The camera just loves him. He has over 90,000 Facebook fans, over a million hits on YouTube, and he's even been a guest on Oprah. Hi, George. This super-sized celeb is Giant George, a great Dane. So great, he holds the Guinness record for tallest dog in the world. But back home in Tucson... Hi, I'm Dave. And I'm Christy. And this is our dog, George. George is just one of the family. And in the new book, Giant George, Life with the World's Biggest Dog, it's clear that this world record holder is really happiest at home, crowded on the couch. I decided to pay a visit to meet this top dog. Okay, so at first, I was a little shocked. Wow, he's, he's huge. So how big is he? George is 43 inches from paw to neck and weighs in at 245 pounds. That's almost twice as tall as the average Golden Retriever, 100 pounds heavier than the average Great Dane, and about the same weight as four German Shepherds, 11 Beagles, or 26 Shih Tzus. All in all, he's closer to the size of the average reindeer than dogs. He's so astronomically huge, even for a Dane. So, like, how do they explain it? Yeah, I mean, there's nothing abnormal about him. It's just we happen to get the world's tallest dog. <laughs> Dave and Christy bought their Great Dane from a breeder in Oregon. George was actually the runt of the litter. What kind of reactions do you get at the vet from other dog owners or other pet owners when you walk in there? I have heard, is that thing a, a horse? Where's their saddle? Yeah, I've heard, yeah, we've heard it a million times. Like he seems, you know, yeah. well behaved. He's a great dog. He's just been a dream, really. He's just a, an awesome dog. That's right, George, you're me. Honestly? Yeah, who do you like? He is awesome. Hanging out with George sort of feels like hanging out with a buddy. Cheers, George. George, how does it feel to be so big? You don't want to talk about it? It's not to say that this beast isn't a handful. For starters, he eats 110 pounds of food a month. Oh, George, you got some appetite. He is so tall that he can eat food right out of the kitchen sink if he wants. But a typical meal, a quarter of a rotisserie chicken, rice, yogurt, dog food, all gently tossed. And take it away. There you go. And while he does have fun with the dogs that he towers over at the park, his preferred pastime, a good old golf cart ride. Just one day with this gentle giant. And I think it's safe to say that we've bonded. Yeah, sometimes I feel like that too. He's a world record superstar. You are a huge celebrity. Thank you for taking the time out to, to hang out with us today. A canine celeb who really just wants to be part of the game. Thanks again to Good Morning America for letting us share their story about Giant George. Yes, George is definitely a big dog, but he's not the biggest Dane on record. That honor goes to Zeus. Zeus is a great Dane from Michigan and was just entered into the Guinness Book of World Records as the world's tallest dog. This three-year-old Dane measures 44 inches from foot to shoulder. When he stands on his hind legs, Zeus stretches to seven feet, four inches tall. He should play basketball. He should. As you can see, he towers over his owner. Denise Dorlag, Zeus weighs 155 pounds and eats 30 pounds of dog food every two weeks. Denise is used to a van to transport him around. So who did Zeus beat out for his title? Yes, it was Giant George. George was the previous holder of the record before Zeus. So seeing George and Zeus made us think about the other large dog breeds in the world. And as a fan, um, and as big as you know, George and Zeus both are, they're not the biggest breed in the world. That honor actually goes to the St. Bernard. At nearly 250 pounds, the St. Bernard is the largest breed in the world. He stands between 27 and 35 inches tall, and he's a very loyal, friendly breed. Next, we have the Mastiff. 
He's 30 inches tall, weighs under the weight of a St. Bernard. Mastiffs are more muscular than the St. Bernard and are considered to be the best guard dogs in the world. I believe that. Uh, third on the list is the Napoleon Mastiff. He stands 31 inches tall but weighs considerably less. The Napoleon Mastiff is known for its protective instincts. And number four on the list is the Newfoundland. It's considered among the strongest dogs in the world and excels at water rescues. These dogs are very loving, very patient, and gentle. Next on the list is the French Mastiff. The French Mastiff, also known as Le Dog du Bordeaux, yes. has a fearless spirit and is an ideal guard dog for those duties. Number six is the Great Dane, as we saw today. A Dane is a beautiful dog that's patient with children. It's the sixth largest but the second tallest on the planet, and it's only second to the Irish Wolfhound. So speaking of the Irish Wolfhound, he is seventh on the list. He's extremely intelligent, but somewhat clumsy. And these dogs are used primarily for wolf hunting. The last three are fairly unknown dogs, and those that I cannot pronounce well. Is the Pressa mm -hmm. Canario, the Pyrenean Mountain Dog, and the this one I can do. Okay. Kuvaz. Yes. Most likely the place you will only see those dogs is at the dog show. Well, thanks to dogsbreedforyou.com for providing us this fun list of large dog breeds. And that's all the time Bandit has for today. Yes, he's so got to go. Thanks to all of our guests <laughs> for being here today. Be sure to keep up with Love of Dogs online at AmericanDogRescue.org. Yes, and as always, be sure and follow us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. So for Fair White, Bandit, and all of us here at For the Love of Dogs, I'm Arthur E. Benjamin, and we'll see you next time.